I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome along to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the 90 Min Football Network. Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Um, apologies for the delay uh, in bringing out a reaction podcast following Arsenal's exit from the Europa League. If you're watching us on YouTube, you'd have gathered by now that I'm not at home, uh, that I am in a hotel room. Hence the funky wallpaper. I promise it's not mine. Um, I'm in Paris again, working on the CAF Champions League. Uh, so I've been here all day, wanted to get this done nice and early, but I just couldn't do it. It just didn't work out. Um, I've had a lot of messages actually from people saying sort of, where is the podcast? Why isn't it up? What's going on? You're slacking, fix up, sort it out. And I completely understand. Um, I'm also connected now on this live stream via my phone because the Wi-Fi in this hotel is just not good enough by the looks of it uh, for me to be able to um, for me to be able to uh, stay on the connection and uh, and trust in it. So um, yeah, I'm on my phone, so that might go tits up at any point as well. So just so you're warned, just so you're aware, just so you know. Um, look, we got to talk about what happened at Emirates Stadium on Thursday night really, really disappointing. Um, we talked about how much the Europa League matters. We talked about whether it mattered as much as the Premier League. I think we all came to an agreement that it doesn't matter as much as the Premier League, but I think it matters. And I think the nature of Thursday night's defeat has the potential to cause a hangover and has the potential to have a knock-on effect, which is my big concern and why I was so disappointed and frustrated, um, you know, when I left from the stadium last night. So let me just talk you through the last sort of few hours for me, because I kind of want to explain as well why the podcast is so late. So um, obviously being at the Emirates, covering the game for radio, it means that you can't leave at the full-time whistle. It means that you've got to stay back. You've got to be in the press conferences. Once you're done with the press conferences, you've got to gather whatever it is that you need and you've got to send it back to the studio. Um so normally that's what I do. So normally I probably leave the ground anywhere between an hour and 10, hour and 20 minutes after the full-time whistle. That's about average. When Arsenal lose, it tends to take a bit longer because probably the, the post-match team talk takes a little bit longer. Uh, Mikel Arteta um, takes a bit longer to come into the media room often. Sometimes... Um, he will come in nice and quick, but he'll be really short, really blunt, not give you any answers. He came in yesterday and the press conference was quite a long one because not only was it looking back on the sporting game, they uh, did a section ahead of the Crystal Palace game, obviously, which is coming up on Sunday. So by the time I got out of Emirates Stadium yesterday, it was nearly midnight. Uh, by the time I wrapped up, finished everything up, Walked out the door. It was nearly midnight. Walked to my car. It was about midnight. Got home about half past 12. And I thought about doing the podcast then. I thought about, um, you know, sitting down and, and recording then, even if it was a pre-record, just to make sure that you guys had it in the morning. But I was absolutely shattered. And in the back of my mind, I knew uh, that I had to be up at 3.30 in the morning to catch my flight out to Paris. Sod's law, there was only one flight available in any of the kind of local airports that would get me here in time to do the first game that I did today. So I've just had a horrendous last 24 hours. The match was shit. The result was shit. The outcome was shit. All the chat around it's been shit. Um, I had a shit flight time. I got here and I was too early to check into my hotel. So because I was too early to check into my hotel, I had to walk around with my bags um. Uh. yeah, I had to walk around with my bags. Listen to this. The place where they put the bags, where you normally leave your bags when you're early, was full. What a joke. Uh, so I had to walk around with my bags. Couldn't really do anything of note because I knew that I had to be at work in a couple of hours. Went to work, did the first game that I was working on today, and then I had a four-hour gap. Four-hour gap. I thought about coming back to the hotel. But if you've seen the Paris traffic, 
by the time you come from where the studio is to get back to the hotel, you need an hour and then you need an hour to go back. And then was there any point in me coming back? Was I going to get any rest? So I didn't bother. So I just left my stuff in the studio, went to a cafe across the road, sat there, had a coffee, croissant, whatever. Um, and, uh, and just killed the time and then did another game at 8 p.m. local time, which would be in 7 p.m. your time in the UK. I just finished that, got in a cab, came back to the hotel, got my room key, came in, threw all my stuff to the side um, and thought I'd better do this because if I don't do this, um, I'm going to get it in the neck. So here I am uh, in all my glory with my fantastic wallpaper. Where was that comment? There was a really wise crack comment in there. Hold on. Uh, where was it? Someone said, there it is. Archangel. Careful, Harry. It's a jungle out there. Very, very good. Very good. Right, look, conscious I've been rambling for a bit. Let's get on to um let's get on to this uh this game against sporting before I fall asleep. Probably ain't gonna wake up till midday tomorrow, if I'm being honest with you. That's the benefit of not having uh the kids with me, I guess. But anyway, look, so I spoke about the Europa League in the build-up. I spoke about it in the week. It does matter to me. Um not only was it tough to take Arsenal crashing out of the competition, but when you think about how it all unfolded and what we're now left with, it was probably the worst possible outcome in terms of what you could have even predicted. So the injuries to Tommy Asu, that one looks dead serious, by the way. I uh, was coming out of the press lounge yesterday um, as I made my way to my car and I looked across uh, to where kind of the team bus is, where the players get on, and that's where the mix zone is. So you would have seen other people reporting on the game saying that they saw him as well. Uh, Tommy Asu was limping around on crutches. William Saliba looked okay, but you don't know really just by looking at him, I don't think. And it's one thing to see someone walking fine, but going out and playing in the Premier League match is a totally different thing. So we don't really know what the situation is uh, with those two in order to kind of really make a concrete assessment on what needs to happen. We hear that William Saliba's problem isn't as serious as maybe some people feared. That he's going to be assessed over the next 48 hours uh, in order to establish whether or not he'll be available for Crystal Palace. Tommy Asu, though, I think is going to be out for a long, long while. I really do. Um, just a gut feel, just based on what I saw, based on what I'm hearing, based on what I've read, just a gut feel that there is going to be um, a... a quite significant injury there and it's frustrating with Tommy Asu because when he first came into the club he was a sensation you know he defended excellently gave us energy going forward not always the technical ability that I'd like to see from an attacking fullback but injuries have just been a problem for him for so long and they're not just one two week injuries you know we're talking long-term injuries we're talking injuries that take him a while to come back from and you know I'm starting to I don't want to say I'm giving up on him, but I'm starting to wonder if he actually does have a future at this football club. And, you know, when you lose and, and when it's a heartbreaking loss, there is, you start to go into a period of kind of reflection, don't you? And, and that's where I feel I'm at with this Arsenal team right now. So I've been super positive all season. I've loved everything I saw. But last night was the first kind of real kick in the bollocks for me because, yeah, we've lost games in the league, but we've bounced back. You, you can't bounce back in a knockout tie on the European stage. Once you're out, you're out. So that was particularly difficult for me to take. I, I've talked personally uh, about how much a European Cup would mean to me. Um, a European trophy of any sort would mean to me. I talked a lot about Mikel Arteta's sort of um, view on momentum and how he wouldn't have wanted to suffer a disappointing result in Europe, even if it's not the priority, because that can cause a hangover and so when I said this panned out in the worst possible way the nature of the defeat in terms of it being on penalties which is always heartbreaking the fact that we picked up two injuries to two important players the fact that some of our players that were earmarked for a rest had to come on and the fact that other players that probably would have been looked at as someone to play 60 70 minutes ended up playing 120 minutes I mean, it doesn't get much worse, does it? Like literally, if if you could have written down a list of all the things that were going to go wrong when creating your worst possible scenario 
off the back of that game against Sporting, you'd have probably captured most of those things. In terms of Mikel's team selection, it was actually stronger than I expected. I certainly didn't expect Jesus to start. Um, I didn't think he was ready. I thought he looked sharp, though, and I thought he looked lively. Um, not quite as clinical in front of goal as we'd like him to be, but that was an, an issue before. Um, hopefully, you know, once the first one goes in, the floodgates will open because we really, really need him. We need the dynamism that he brings. We need the energy that he brings. We need the sophistication in our centre forward play that he brings. And although it was only 45 minutes, I thought he looked really sharp and that was really, really encouraging. Um, so that's the positive, I guess, to take away uh, from last night. So going back to the team selection, didn't expect him to play. Didn't think that both Saliba and Gabriel would play. I thought it would be one or the other. Didn't think Zinchenko would play. Um, okay, the midfield is much weaker without Partey and Odegaard, but in particular with the Ghanaian, we, you know, we've got to be careful. So I was fine with it at the time, Mikel Arteta's lineup. As I say, if anything, it was probably a little bit stronger than I might have gone. So I'd be a hypocrite if I sat here now and said that Mikel Arteta got the team wrong. Yes, you can look back at stuff with hindsight and you can judge whether a decision was right or wrong. But to really stick the boot in on someone who did something that you would have done or something similar is um, is hypocritical. You know, yeah, OK, we're here to assess, we're here to analyse, but I don't have a problem with the team that Mikel picked. What I have a problem with was the level of performance. We did not start the game with the level of intensity that we normally do. We did not start in a way that riled the crowd. We did not start in a way that whipped up a frenzy within Emirates Stadium. We did not get that energy or we did not create that energy that Mikel Arteta always talks about transmitting from the fans to the players, etc. We just didn't do that. And we allowed a very good technical side like Sporting to settle down nice and early, make themselves at home, make themselves comfortable. And they just grew in confidence as the game went on. And there were stages in that game where I thought we were going to lose it. I'm talking about in the 90. There were stages in that game where I felt that we didn't deserve to win it. Again, talking about the 90. There were stages where I did feel we deserved to win it. And there was points, certainly, where Arsenal were on top. But generally speaking, um, you know, it, it was up and down. It was up and down. And once Pedro Gonzalez scored that goal, which, by the way, is one of the best goals I've ever seen live. Hard to say it at the time. Hard to probably even say it now um, because of what it meant for Arsenal. But easily one of the standout goals I've seen live. Unbelievable finish. You know, I, I heard some people as I was walking out the ground yesterday questioning Aaron Ramsdale on that. Go back and look at Aaron Ramsdale's position. It's not an outrageous position that he's standing in. And we all know that he's asked to stand in those positions so that he can sweep up, so that he can offer an option when passing the ball back. So, yeah, I mean, just watch it back again without the emotion, without the frustration, and and you'll appreciate the goal, if nothing else. Real football people will, I promise. Um, so, yeah. Um, the team, I'm okay with the team. But as I say, the level of intensity wasn't there. We allowed Sporting to make themselves at home. And then we go and score a goal. And when we go and score a goal, I'm sitting there thinking... This is going to be one of those classic nights where we don't actually play that well. We don't pull up any trees, but we just get over the line. You know, we just tick along. We make them pay when it matters. It was a wonderful ball from Jorginho in behind for Martinelli. Martinelli gets there, works the goalkeeper. It comes to Granite Xhaka, who would, by the way, never have been in that position prior to this season. Because he's in a different mindset now. He's, his game is very different. He occupies very, very different spaces on the football pitch. That's why he's got, I think, five goals now this season when previous seasons, you'd be lucky if he got two. You know, he's really developed on that side of things and the finish was really good. And at that point, I'm thinking, happy days. Great, we're going to go on and win this. But there were signs towards the end of the first half and at the start of the second half that we weren't as in control as we thought we were and that Sporting had a goal in them 
and had the ability to create chances. In the end, their goal didn't even come from a great chance, but they did create a great chance for Marcus Edwards, uh, which he missed. We had some chances as well. Um, Gabriel's ones, Trossard's one off the post. It could have gone either way. Um, and, and the problem you've got is that, yeah, okay, I'm all right with the team that Mikel picked. and I don't really have a problem with that. But we've seen it time and time again this season that when you start to move around some of the pieces, we just don't have the same level of quality. And because you've moved some of the pieces around, it all becomes a little bit disjointed. Now, there are certain players. So, for example, I'll give you an example. If you put Tommy Asu in at right back instead of Ben White, there is a difference. But is it the type of difference that makes the world of difference? I don't think it does in a game like the one we had on Thursday. So at that level, Europa League level, I don't think it makes the world of difference. If he had played Kieran Tierney instead of Zinchenko, okay, we might have played slightly differently because he wouldn't have been able to do the inverted role as well. But is he a liability? No. The problem we've got is that when you look at a lot of these players that we're talking about potentially bringing in, right? So think about who played the other night. Um, Fabio Vieira played, Jorginho played, um, Reese Nelson played. If you put one of them in the starting lineup, it's okay. So, for example, if you've got Partey and Xhaka and then you put Fabio Vieira in Odegaard's position, it's passable. It's not as good, but it's passable. If you play with the, the major start or, or the first choice 11, and then you stick Reese Nelson in on the left. It's passable because he's got all the rest of them around him. Once you start moving two, three pieces, in particular in midfield yesterday, where we just never got hold of the game. So if you take Odegaard out and you take Partey out and you put in Jorginho and Vieira alongside Xhaka, it's just not the same. And Sporting were good enough on the ball to make us pay for that. And not only that, they were a lot more combative this time uh, with Manuel Ugarte returning to the team, who was sent off uh, on Thursday night, but he's a fantastic player. Excellent on the ball, excellent off the ball. I thought he was really, really good. He's someone I'd look at genuinely. I was really, really impressed with him. Really impressed. So the, the chopping and changing, it doesn't really work. Um, when we do it like that, there are certain areas of the park where I understand Mikel wants to give people a rest. Uh, you know, I was all for leaving Bukayo Saka out as he did from the start. I was all for leaving Thomas Partey out. I was OK with Odegaard being out, but he's just got to think a little bit more about how he manages these rotations. Because what we've seen throughout the Europa League campaign this season is just disjointed performances, poor performances, um, a lack of cohesion, a lack of rhythm. And it's an ongoing theme. And yesterday we ended up in a situation where we basically had our first team on the pitch. Uh, come the end of the game and you don't want to be in those situations and you might not be if you just find the balance in terms of the way you manage it and, and, and focus on that balance and identify what that is a little bit more so that's where I'm at on that I mentioned Granit Xhaka's goal um, obviously immediately overshadowed by the fact that Saliba went off because that was my bigger concern at that point um, we've talked about the injuries already so I'm not going to go over that again but I do want to touch on a few individual players. So I do want to touch on Jorginho, who I thought had his worst game in an Arsenal shirt by probably a country mile. I thought it was really, really bad. Um, I thought that Zinchenko was completely ineffective, uh, really disappointed in his performance. I thought that Reese Nelson could have done more, um, had a couple of flashpoints, a couple of moments. But with Reese Nelson, the reason I don't want to go in on him now is because I really don't think Reese Nelson is a right winger. Now, I understand how Mikel will be looking at this. He will look at it and say, Gabriel Martinelli has been absolutely fantastic all season from the left. Reese Nelson's been good, but he hasn't done enough to displace Gabriel Martinelli. And I completely understand that. So I understand why Nelson, if you're going to put him in the team, has to start from the right. But I just don't see the same player when he plays from the right-hand side. He's a very, very different performer when he plays on the right-hand side in comparison to the left. And these are the types of things 
that Mikel Arteta needs to, I don't want to get wiser. I don't want to say get wiser on because I'm sure he knows them. But obviously we're seeing these things implemented. We've seen them implemented throughout our Europa League campaign. And we've performed really poorly, you know, really badly, actually, um, throughout the duration of it. It's been dull performances, dead performances, lack of energy, lack of rhythm, lack of anything, basically. Um, I've seen a lot of people on social media overreacting. And listen, you can react to an Arsenal defeat however the hell you want to react. I'm not going to sit here and preach to people as to how they should react or what their thoughts should be or anything like that. But just look at where we are, man. You know, look at where we are. The The Premier League is is our priority, clearly. Um, do we benefit from having less games? Probably. Um, that is the, a, another silver lining, along with the fact that Jesus looked fit. Do we have any distractions? No. And when you look at the path that we would have gone on, it probably would have been Juventus and then probably Man United after that. So those ties you feel would have taken a lot out of us had we continued in the competition. So on the one hand, it, it you know, it might prove to be a blessing, but if it does turn out to be a positive thing, it's not, you know, it, it's still not something that I'm going to get go big on because you want to be in these competitions. You want to go as far as possible. You want to win silverware. And as I've said for the last few weeks now, you're not going to be an elite team if you can't play every three or four days. You know, when the Champions League comes along, that same team is going to have to play and we're going to have to be able to rotate well enough and effective enough to be able to cope with any rotations that we need to. So, yeah, I mean, look, my view on Arsenal season so far hasn't changed. I still think it's been an unbelievable season. I still think that we are um, well ahead of schedule and I don't really think what happened on Thursday impacts our chances of going on and winning the Premier League. What I would say is it's increased the significance of Sunday's game. If Arsenal can get back on the wagon with a win against managerless now Crystal Palace, typical new manager bounce again just before us, what are the chances? If Arsenal can get back on the wagon by beating Crystal Palace, I don't care how. It could be a 1-0 scrappy goal, penalty, whatever. If Arsenal get over the line against Palace, then I think Thursday becomes a distant memory. If Arsenal don't beat Crystal Palace, all of a sudden it becomes something that is going to be a weight on our players' shoulders, something that's going to mentally take a toll and affect them because they'll have a whole international break to sit on it. So it's imperative to me that Arsenal go out and win on Sunday. It was always important anyway. This is one of the games that you look at and you think it's got to be a home banker if you're going to win the league. Um but even more so now, even more so now, because, you know, we've proven in the Premier League we can bounce back. But as I said, the Premier League gives you an opportunity to do that because it's 38 games and you're going to play every single one, no matter what happens. But I just want to make sure, I just want them to show me, I just want to see that Martinelli hasn't been affected by the penalty miss, that the mood in the camp isn't dull, that the mood in the stadium isn't down and that then transmits across. I just want everything to be, you know, it's almost like hit the refresh button, restart, and let's go out there and beat Crystal Palace. And if we do that, then Thursday becomes a distant memory. And I will at that point say that Thursday's outcome has had no implications or will have no implications on our chances of winning the Premier League title. So Sunday is massive. And I'm back on time for that. I'm going to get back to Luton Airport at about eight o'clock in the morning. And then I'm going to make my way ASAP down to Emirates Stadium uh, for that one. The first game I'm going to in about four or five months as a fan, not working, not in the press box. And I'm so excited. You know, I've really missed sort of catching up with people and friends and seeing them and traveling together and having a drink or whatever. I haven't done any of that for ages. So I'm really, really looking forward to Sunday. Hopefully the result Um gives us what we want as well so yeah look don't dwell on it don't get caught up on it um i, I i'm not going to sit here and say i'm happy we went out of the europa league i won't go that far i might sit here if we do go on and win the premier league and say maybe it was a blessing in disguise but at this point you can't say that it's pure speculation it's guesswork and 
you never want to crash out of a European trophy, especially not at home, especially against a side that, you know, I fancied us over two legs to beat. So, yeah, um, it is what it is. We've got to be able to compartmentalise it, put it to one side. Arsenal have shown us that they can do that this season already. Now they've got to do it again. They've got to dig deep when it matters. Um, mentioned a few of the individual players. We'll talk about the injuries in a lot more detail as soon as we have more detail on them. Just to update you, if you're just joining us, uh, William Saliba is going to be assessed over the next 48 hours. Uh, he had a back issue and uh, Takehiro Tomiyasu uh, looks like he could be out for a while based on uh, gut feel and, and sort of the, the whispers coming out of the place at the moment. So, yeah, um, we are where we are. Forget about Thursday. Put it to one side. It's over now. It's done. It's all about Sunday now. It's all about Sunday. But I did think the performance was poor on Thursday. I did think we looked disjointed. I did think the rotation impacted us um, just as it had in previous Europa League games this season. Only this time we came up against an opponent that was good enough and good enough specifically on the day to punish us for it. Uh, we've been getting away with it up until that point. So, yeah, um, it is what it is. We move forward. We build. Uh, we continue. We go on to Sunday. Um I don't know what I'm going to do with regards to the preview show yet, just because I am obviously, as you can see, in a hotel. I'm in Paris. Um, internet connection isn't great. Um, and I'm struggling with my kind of work schedule at the moment to um, fix it all. But hopefully I'll be able to get something out to you guys tomorrow, looking ahead to that Crystal Palace game. What I am going to say, um, which uh, some of you might not care about, some of you will, some of you won't. What I'm going to say is um, following the um, following the Crystal Palace game, we'll be bringing you the post-match show on the Sunday night. That'll be available uh, to everybody else. Um, audio listeners, that is, uh, as soon as we finish the live. So we're definitely going to do that. After that, I am going to take a few days out. Um, I'm going to take a few days off. I am running on empty. Um, I told you what my 24 hours has been like, uh, you know, over the last couple of days. I'm working tomorrow. I've uh, got another two games of TV commentary to do. Then I fly back at the crack of dawn on Sunday. Then I go to Arsenal. Then after Arsenal, we're going to do all the post-match stuff. And I just figured with the international break, it's the only opportunity I'm going to get between now and the end of the season to sit back, put my feet up just for a few days. Look, if anything major breaks, if there's any big news, of course I'll be all over it. Of course I'll jump on it. But I want to just scale back for a few days and recover because my throat hurts. I feel tired. Um, and I feel like I'm burning the candle at all ends at the moment. So um, I hope you guys understand. I'm sure you'll be fine um, without the podcast for a few days. Um, I am grateful that so many of you have it as part of your routine. I am grateful um, that, you know, I had 50 odd messages today from people saying, where the hell's the podcast? It means that you guys love it and it means that you guys are continuing to support it. So thank you. Um, but yeah, I just need a few days to recharge and then we'll go full steam ahead, uh, between, uh, then and the end of the season. Right. I'm going to leave it there. Don't dwell on Thursday. Don't get too caught up on it. It is what it is. We move on. Let's go and beat Crystal Palace. Let's do the job on Sunday. And that'll be a distant memory because we've got 11 cup finals to play. Remember, I'll catch you all soon. Thank you for tuning in. I'm going to get some shot eye. Goodbye. I'm Martin Tyler. And you're listening to Harry Simeon. <laughs>